Hey guys, Steve here, from Potent Ponics. Today we're going to talk about... Growing with fishes. Growing with fishes. Yes, Brendan. Uh, Brendan is uh, one of the owners of Spectrum King. He is also a, a microbial uh, expert as well with uh, BioCat Grow More. Or, I'm sorry, BioCat More Grow With More. Yeah, That's the site's Grow I With always, More. With, yeah, yeah. It's BioCat yes, I always get it wrong. Yeah. Sorry. 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 I'll let you explain it uh, since I, I always get it backwards. Um. Well, yeah, Spectrum King for lighting. Right? And, you know, we're we're plant nerds and we obsess over it. So we're always studying the latest in technology to get the best results from plants. And then on the microbial side with BioCat Solutions, we have the more product, which you can find at growwithmore.us. And the idea with more was we saw like buildup, like even in your aquaponic scenarios. I mean, when you see fish that are lackluster in appearance and kind of sluggish, it's because there's parasites and there's all these things going on there. and what we found with with more whether it's a straight hydro setup or it's cocoa or you know soil a lot of times but the aquaponics guys found out that their fish are cleaner and we have some aquarium people that said we'll try it we'll try it and you know uh happier cleaner fish less parasite problems and less build up because it breaks down virtually anything so that's the beauty of it uh we called it more because it's not a, a one trick pony type product. It does a lot of things. It micro chelates any buildup, whether it's salt buildup or some other sort of biofilm, it will break it down and turn it back into plant available food. So it's a fun thing to have. Awesome. Now, so, so tell us more about, you know, it's a pretty unique product. It's actually a beneficial archaea. There aren't that, as far as I'm aware, there aren't really any other ones out there. Well, it, it's it's a, a proprietary blend, but, you know, archaea, it definitely one of the species which no one really knows much about, but protobacteria archaea are like the, the beginning of time, if you will. They're, they're like the oldest, smallest species, and they have specific niches. And when you find the recipe, you know, we have upwards of six, 700 different species living in balance, which defies most people's perception of what microbials do. Because they think, you know, you put in 13 types of, of uh, trichoderma and then, you know, trichoderma harzanium is probably gonna win, you know, and become the dominant species. But when you have a, a well-balanced microbiota, um, they kind of share jobs and work together in tandem. Um, yes, there will be species that take over depending upon the food source but they won't eradicate the others. And the beauty of it is if your pH goes this way, these species will pick it up. If, you're, if your newt's level go this way, this species will pick it up. And it just, they perpetually break things down. So uh, as far as buildup goes, you know, we've had big naysayers and big indoor growers who are like, you know, it's bullshit, it's expensive, it, the dose is too big. I said, how about this? Run it and see for yourself. And, you know, now we have a thing we call the bio, bio catalyzer because, you know, the big farms, nobody wants to ship around totes of liquids. I mean, you know, a lot of guys use dry salts, obviously makes their own stuff on site to save shipping that liquid weight. And with freight charges today, it doesn't make any sense to ship liquid. It really doesn't. It's just crazy expensive. So we actually have a system where it's your own brewing unit on site for big farms. We even make a desktop unit that can make the stuff for you and you just reload cartridges every week. So, you know, it's finding solutions to get better results from your plants, your animals, uh, organically, really. You know, there's no, I don't want to use any toxic chemicals if we can avoid it. So I'm going to kind of dance around between lighting and microbials because there's a reason why I'm involved in both. Um, you know, back where doing HPS grows, you know, and, and everyone in this field who's been around growing for a while played with bulbs for years, decades, if not longer. And you kind of developed a recognition of what the plants were doing, what they wanted. You kind of got that formula down. Then when you switch lighting sources, well, a lot of those paradigms, it's, it's a shift. It's not exact same thing. You can't do the same formula, the same method and expect the same results because it's a different light source. It induces different behaviors in the plant. 
the plant's gonna change its diet a little bit. It's gonna want the environmental variables more like outdoor because our, our quality of light is more like natural sunlight. So when you have a fuller, if you will, a fuller buffet of light for the plant to eat, it actually ingests food at a different rate and not at the same um, levels of each. So you may find with, for example, if you're, if you're growing LED that you're gonna want your canopy temperature to be like 85 degrees and your humidity to be like 65, 70%. And some guys will say, well, that's gonna give me mold. And my answer would be, if you were growing under bulbs, that's a strong possibility. But if you were growing outdoors in Jamaica, that's exactly what you'd have. And the plants wouldn't have any parasites or mold or anything like that. Um, stimulating the plants to produce their own secondary metabolites, which are great for us for THC, but also for the plant's own immune system, for systemic autoimmune response, by stimulating with other light bandwidths, the plant is overall healthier. So then it comes down to the intensity in the beginning of the blurple days or the red and blue disco lights, or whatever you already referred to them as, you got great buds up top and they were dense and they were a trichy as hell, but that was it. Because they didn't have that, they didn't understand that, that full spectrum is what gets the light to penetrate the entire plant. Then once we got that recipe down, and we have a patent on it, by the way, once we got that down and we patented it, we also have the intensity level, which makes a massive difference. So we have the plants growing, they're stockier, they're stouter, they're more like outdoor plants. We're getting much better bed penetration. You don't have to lollipop 18 inches or two feet in the bottom of your plant up anymore. You can just clean up a foot or so for airflow. So now instead of having 18 inches to 24 inches of canopy that's valid, you could have three feet easy. And suddenly when guys start listening to what we asked them to do for environmental results, well, all of a sudden LEDs didn't suck anymore. And other companies started copying us. And then states like California, who are saying flat out, in 2023, you have to grow with LED. You cannot use as much power as using with bulbs. The state can't maintain this. The power grid can't support it. Well, now they're going, well, if we have to figure this out, let's learn how to do it right. We have plenty of proof of results from all over the world of what the lights can do. If you don't believe us, we'll show you. I mean, do your own Instagram search, do your own internet search. We don't have to go out and creative storytell like some other companies do. We have real people showing real results, whether it's a 140 watt light closet case up to the 602s or the low pro flowers. You know, when I first demoed the low pro flowers and I got three and a half pounds of light, people were like, that's bullshit. You pull these plants in from another room, this, that, that. We have week by week footage showing the plants weren't moved. Other people's results, you know, big commercial farms getting that, depending on the strain, two and a half to three and a half a light, you know, like clockwork. And then I said, well, would you like to do better than that? They said, yeah, but what's it cost? I said, well, I'm not asking you to change your lights. I'm asking you to, to try another product we have, which is more. And now we have big commercial farms in the LA area who got their big biocatalyzers, the BCT for short, we call it on site. And they added more to the recipe because they saw with their own eyes that they now got eight to 11% improvements in yield and plant quality. So our obsession over growing the best buds and the cleanest, healthiest with, without chemicals has never stopped. We're not gonna stop trying to find better ways. And if you're the aquaponics side of things, obviously you wanna see your fish healthier and your less biofilm and your nose I mean, nothing worse than being punched in the nose by a dirty system. When you open a filter and just about puke, well, you, that's not gonna happen anymore. If you use more properly, you won't have that awful buildup and you'll have things broken down to plant available form. Now, like Steven mentioned earlier about other crops needed and, and other things not to use, that sense still applies. You know, there's no magic bullet for having too much nitrogen if, you, if your recipe's off. The, 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 the proper plants to assist with that Obviously, Steven knows that inside and out, and I'll leave that to him. As far as the lighting over the top and the more and the nutrient line on the inside, I can tell you without reservation that if you use Spectrum King lighting above pushing your plants hard and your water temperature and things are right and your feed levels right, that you'll you'll see your your EC and your PPM will change drastically. But more importantly, you won't have pH spikes by using more. It really helps keep things in a sweet spot. And that's just the balance of microbials. There's no special hidden formula of chemicals in there to do that. There's no encapsulated alkaline and acidic things that open up depending on the pH level like some other brands of nutrients have. This is straight up old school natural. 
and you, how would you put this? I've been in grows. I've been lucky enough to be in grows in a lot of parts of the world. And I've learned some pretty cool things here and there and everywhere. And I've also seen a whole lot of stupid and old school ideas that were being maintained. That time's over with the internet, with us sharing information, which are allowed to speak about it. I mean, 25 years ago, we had like secret hand gestures, like a baseball third base coach to, to transmit signals to each other because we didn't know who was listening or who was watching. Now we can say, hey, how'd you get that? And we can just sit down in a Starbucks and have a wide open conversation. It changes everything that we can go forward productively. Like Stephen and I, you know, when we get together and just sit around and we start talking, because both of our heads spin at a different speed, people around us go, what the is going, what do you, what do you, what is going on here, man? Like you guys are all over the place, but it makes sense to us because there's so much stuff that we're passionate about that these are all valid subjects and every little part helps us get closer to the result we want, the better plants, whether it's greenhouse glazing or it's a filter type or it's a flow rate or it's a lighting intensity or it's a, you know, a variable like a microclimate, like this corner of the room is too cold or too dry or it's too wet, you know, every little thing, when you start really watching your plants, they'll tell you. And if you get the microbials balanced and you get your lighting balanced, it's so much easier to see your plants. Back in the HPS days, and I'm sorry if I sound like a broken record, but I couldn't tell if my plants had a minor deficiency for about three or four days because I couldn't see it. Under LED, full spectrum lighting, same day service. You, you know, the angle of the leaf, the tip, the edge, you see it all right away. So if there's any imbalance, and in aquaponics, you know, you, you want to stay in a sweet spot because if you get too far up or down, you know, you can recover, but that's going to affect your end, your end of the harvest run is never going to be the same if you had that couple days of what the, what the fuck in the middle. Sorry, but offended somebody, but this is how I talk. It's the idea to get things right. When you have the variables right, your eyes become hyper-focused on your plants. And that's my favorite part of it. I have a hearing problem. My eyesight's not what it used to be, but if I'm in a garden and I'm just looking at plants. It's, it's, you know, some people go to Disney World for excitement. I'd rather be in a good garden with, and not with too loud and with the buzzing of, of ballast. I don't like dig that side of it. That's why I like LEDs. It's much quieter, but you can see every little thing, you know, and, um, and I have a question for you on sure. that new California law. Is that going to apply to vegetable growers as well with the LEDs? Or is that strictly um, the cannabis? I, I think it's from one and to the other slow enough because the, the analysis for the power companies has really been focused on cannabis growers because, you know, the vegetable people have been doing what they've been doing for a long time. They're consistent, you know. And when the cannabis growers went online, they went, oh my God, this sector of the grid is completely overdrawn. We're going to blow things. We, we, we got to figure something out. And when we showed the power saving, and more importantly, the secondary power savings with less cooling needed, that it's, it's exponential. You have guys who are dropping two, three tiers of service with the same amount of lights turned on. So... That means if each farm can save 30 to 40, 50% of their power, their power bill, and you have 100, you have 100 facilities, facilities in the same little segment of a network, network, that's thousands, thousands of homes, of homes that can be powered, be powered without, without any, any intervention needed, nothing extra added. Extra added. So it just well, makes sense that, that for grid stability, we have to find light sources that, that use less power. And, um, I didn't realize my mic was open. I apologize. No, but it was great. Echo and slap back and the bong effects really added to the whole thing. So I dig it. I, I sincerely apologize. guys. <laughs> it's all good, Steve. I was going to say is um, with the, uh, light, the other thing with the lighting is a lot of people don't know that's a law coming into effect. Do you want to mention that? Yeah. And there are other states that are going to be that are looking at it strictly because in a lot of ways, whether it's automotive emissions or, you know, lighting, California has been at the forefront and, and uh, love it or hate it. There's, you know, there's a lot of things which get kind of crazy out here. Um, now we know that's the game plan. And what I really dig is that the next generation of lighting that we're working on and we're ready to put out by the end of this year, it's, 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 it's a quantum leap as far as performance. And as the LED industry becomes 
more mainstream and the technology is coming together, it's exponentially faster, like in the computer world, where we're hitting another generation of things almost every 18 months, two years, where it used to be three to five years, now it's speeding up. So um, getting things dialed in and then new technologies like the anti-sulfurization treatment that some LED brands are now doing, you know, gardeners, whether we like it or not, and some gardeners that didn't even know it, didn't know that sulfur is the kryptonite of LEDs. And we had commercial growers who were old school, not adding it to their plants and feeding it or, or, or foliar spraying, but they were actually burning sulfur in their hoop houses and in their indoor grows. And of course, then they're saying these lights suck, they're dying. I'm like, you signed right here that says you cannot use sulfur with LEDs. The only negative thing you can. The next generation of LEDs has an anti-sulfurization treatment and we're looking into other secondary things we can do to use more, um, I would say less porous products to protect the diodes and light engines. Uh, even glass, you could have a glass, like our current lights have glass lenses, but the off-gassing baffle, because the sulfur molecules are so small, sulfur can still find a way in. It just shortens your lifespan, but it, it's pretty obvious to see sulfur damage. Uh, if, if you turn that light off, you can see right away. But anyway, that, that's a separate argument altogether. What I like is the technology is coming into play now. It's where that's no longer going to be a problem, where it was an issue in the past for certain things. Um, other competitors of ours, what they did is they made their lights kits or they made their lights come with bare wire, which means it's an infrastructure thing. It's, it's a local jurisdiction thing where they don't, they don't have responsibility for it because they didn't wire it in. Um, that's pretty cheesy from Spectrum King's perspective. We want, you know, we back our products. We, you know, we grow with our products. I want people to be happy with their stuff. I don't care if it's a little light or a big light. If you have an issue with it, we want to hear about it. And anyone who knows that's called Spectrum King, I mean, a whole lot of people have spoken to me because they call and ask. You know, um, I would rather deal with people. And if you have questions, just send them to us, you know, um, whether it's sales at spectrumkinglady.com or directly to any of the reps of the people. If you're working with somebody, you have a question for me, they'll, they'll ask me. No one's shy about it. We want you to be successful with your grow light and we want to answer your questions. And I like answering grow questions because when I started, I had to screw up a lot of plants because I could not find anyone I could have an adult conversation with. And then more importantly, it was, it was almost like you were stepping into a cult and what the local cult leader said was law. That's what you did. Now they could be completely wrong with their recipe. And until you train wrecked a couple of times and realized that that guy's full of it, you're out a few crops or worse, or you were out altogether because you blew your money on buying supplies to get growing and your crop sucks and it's awful. And you know, those days are behind us. Any kid anywhere that wants to grow can just go to YouTube and in one Saturday afternoon, have a very good idea of what to do. A lot of veterans, you know, need help. And I loved helping in veterans. We offer veterans discount to this day because our own government's not taking care of them properly. We've teaching people to take care of themselves. You know, they are like the old adage, teach a fisherman to fish is a lot better than just giving them a fish. I, I want people to be, be more aware of what they put in their own bodies. And I want people to be able to take care of themselves. Crazy concept, I know, but if you have the right light above, the plant's getting the right recipe of light it needs to do all its re reactions aside to create flowers or fruit or even leafy greens. Then it comes down to what nutrients they need and how are they getting them and in what format. And on the nutrient side of things, a lot of people don't understand is that someone says NPK in their label and they have their, their, their micro and their macronutrients listed, but they don't say what form they're in. You know, is it phosphorus or is it a phosphate? You know, is it nitrogen? Is it NH2, NH3, or NH4? NH4 is more complex than ammoniacal nitrogen. It's harder for the plant to process. So that stuff's going to build up in your system because the plant's going, I, I can't waste this much energy to break that compound down. But if you give me cold pressed fist hydrolysate NH2, that's like junky food and they're going to absorb it right away. So you don't need as much. So you study all the things the plant needs and you find out that if you have a wee dose of strontium, plants handle calcium better. And you start up opening up all these new worlds of, I didn't know that, well, how far can I take this? Where can I go with this? A lot of that legwork's been done for you. 
I mean, Stephen has been in the trenches with every single type of water-induced system there could be, you know, and knowing what not to do saves everyone listening a metric fuck ton of pain. So our mistakes that we learn from, we will gladly share with you what not to do because the what not to do is will save your time, your money, and your crop. So I know you can grow with HPS. I know you can grow with other LEDs. I know what kind of results I want, and I know I wasn't getting them with those other sources. So like when Rami and I you know, got together, and Dave and the guys, and we got together and started Spectrum King, we had a mission. You know, We were going to show people that full spectrum light was what it is and how you do it, and there's a specific little blend of things that we have and we patented that we did. And then everyone told us we were idiots and full of it and, you know, yada, yada, bad, bad, negative, negative, LEDs suck, all that stuff. But a couple years later, Instagram's getting bigger. YouTube guys are have their channels up. And people are going, that dude's buds are killer. How do you grow that with? No way. That's not LED. No way. That's not LED. And from there it went. And uh, every time I walk into a big commercial facility, the first thing I do is stop, close my eyes, and take a deep breath. And everybody goes, what the hell are you doing? I go, and I am taking a reading on the room with my nose. Why? Because the human nose is an extremely accurate tool. I'm like a bloodhound. If there's a problem in that room, I can smell it. And when you get around enough stuff and you've made your own mistakes, there's certain smells, smells and odors that will punch you in the head that you don't want. Red flag to the brain. You smell it. Oh, damn it. Root rot. Oh, damn it. You just know it. More. Biocast Solutions more really helps mitigate a lot of these things because it doesn't allow them to develop in the first place. You know, imagine you're looking at a, a, a feed tube is basically like an artery and your feeds, you know, it's the blood pumping through and it's being circulated. Well, if the salts are building up and reducing the flow of that artery and your emitter, the plant at the beginning of the line looks fine. The plant in the middle is a little smaller. The plant at the end looks sick because the artery is blocked. It's not flowing the same, it's not getting there. It's stagnating and there's backflow pressure. Now you've got all this dead or unused salts blocking things. When you put more in there and it, it breaks them down or if you start in the beginning with more, you won't have the buildup in the first place. All that time, if you've ever had to take apart a feed line system, a main line and clean it out, you know what an absolute disaster of an aroma and what a hard job it is to do. If you didn't have to do that at all and you could just clean the room and repopulate the next day, wouldn't that be what you'd want to do? Save yourself and your employees all that negative, dirty work? I know for me, it was that simple. When we, we did the test with more, we're like, we have got to get this to people's hands. They're not going to believe how much time they're going to save on all the cleanup and flushing and all those details that take a lot of time. With commercial accounts now, you have you know places that are turning over crops sometimes same day. You know, I've been in facility uh, in what places in Sullivan, Illinois, I mean, the, the one crew was yelling at the other crew to get done so they could load. You know, like the guy's got a cart of plants, like, dude, you got to get done. We got to start going. Get one, get at least the first few trays ready. We're coming in. And I've been in places in California where it's, you know, it's, it's like a, a, lot, a shift change at a factory. You know, night guys come in, they whack through them clean. The morning guys come in, they reload it. And boom, that cycle's underway. The charge on the door and we're following that recipe, their bag tag. They got their the metric tags on them and everything that ever happens from that point forward is logged. That's where we're at. This is the modern world of growing. Why not share all the pertinent information we can and do all the studying we can to get better results? If we simplify the labor side of things, everyone's more focused on their plants. And when you're focused on your plants is where you win because you see everything. You can react and, and fix things as they come. I hope that makes sense, but that's really my kind of an obsession. I want people to be able to focus on their plants, not noise from broken machines, not trying to figure out why a pump's not working. Just focus on your plants because the system just works. Pump impellers, especially in aquaponics, man, those things get rank stank awful. If you can keep that going and get your filtration system where it's still doing its job but not being constipated by buildup from fish poop, it's a huge difference. It's a huge gain. Awesome. So uh, you guys have some pretty awesome lights for, for home growers and commercial mm -hmm. growers. Uh, you want to talk about that a little bit? Because uh, a lot of people, you know, especially for the LED scene, uh, they're mm -hmm. definitely my favorite lights. We actually, I first contacted them. We did a side-by-side -side at 
the aquaponics source and um, we had we went and bought like six or eight of the best lights out there and did a side by side and the spectrum king kind of slaughtered all the other ones uh, uh even ones that cost more money than it so uh, that's actually how we first reached out to to spectrum king initially and then uh kind of became friends after that so uh, uh tell everybody about you know some of the different stuff that you guys have sure um just to paint a picture when spectrum king when we started this and it seems like a long time ago but it's, you know it's six and a half years ago um a good led light was like three thousand or thirty five hundred bucks let's just put that that number in mind everyone was like you're out of your mind you're batshit crazy that's way too much money we came out at 1279 with a full spectrum light that did a better job and everyone just went what, what, what? hold on you know these guys they, they, they negative us they you know we took a lot of heat but we didn't stop with changing the game giving you a better performance for your dollars than anyone had done before and even though we're still now we're considered like the ferrari rolls royce of lights we don't cost ferrari rolls royce prices because we know what it costs to make them and we build our lights in los angeles so i'm not ordering something from a, from a catalog overseas and going and slapping a sticker on and going this is my new light no we actually nerd out <laughs> steven's been around the office when we're having like let's call it warm discussions because one guy's opinion is stronger than another and we're beating each other up almost but getting the recipe right getting the components right whether it's a 140 watt light or a 630 watt light it's a different tool for a different job if you tell me hey man i'm a retiree i just want to have a few plants for myself in a small tent i have a three by three by six tent i will tell you get a cc 140 and you're done from start to finish one light seed the skillet you're done you'll, you'll be fine one of the winners of our contest a couple of years ago before the current version the new v2 cc 140 is literally 40 percent brighter than its predecessor with the same power consumption and a more compact body as well. Um, we had a guy who got four plants, two ounces per plant. So he got a half pound with 140 watt light. Doesn't sound like a lot. Trust me, when, when, when other people's 200 watt or 300 watt LED was getting someone six ounces and they got a half pound with 140 watts, that's an epic slap down of other people's lights. There were brands of LEDs that were up front and center two, three, four, five years ago that you don't even hear about anymore. Through all of it, we're still valid because we're not gonna stop pushing it to the next level. If you're in a three by three tent and you wanna grow a few flowering plants for yourself, the Closet Case 140 watt CC 140 is the way to go. If you're in a four by four tent and you're vegging and you just grow on leafy greens and plants you're gonna transfer like to your greenhouse and go bigger later, Mother's Little Helper 140 watt. You could veg easily a four by four area with just 140 watts. If you're flowering in a four by four tent and you it's just seven feet tall, that's what an SK402 does. That's what it's meant for. If you're if you're vegging but you don't have a lot of vertical space, we have a 402 veg for commercial guys. But really, commercial people I'm finding are doing more and more vertical farming. So that's more of the low pro line of products. The low pro veg, you know, you have guys two, three le levels in, in per, per rack. And, you know, the whole fixture takes up a couple inches vertically. And whether it's remote power system or regular plug-in driver units, we now can daisy chain them together with a, with a single controller. Um, Low-pro flower, if you're flowering in vertical farming or you're flowering in a tent and you want to go bigger plants but you don't have a lot of space, you'll crush it with that. I mean, that, that was the first low-profile fixture that we got well over three pounds of light a couple runs in a row and you know just massive colas and people are like there's no way you did that with an led and i'm like well here are the video links here are the pictures here's the week by week showing the same plant has not been moved didn't even turn it around wanted people to see the plant as it was as it developed so they know there was no trickery involved um we have a second generation of the low pros are going to be out the end of this year the new generation of the 140 watts are out right now the cc 140 v2 and the mlh 140 v2 are out right now the 402 is still valid the 602 is still valid we are going next generation of them and there'll be some pretty large changes with that um, as i mentioned earlier the next generation of led technology is really friggin interesting so we're going to have a much much better overall output the 403 will literally be like a mini 603 in the sense of its output it will be 
a bazooka. And the 603 will be the brightest, best spectrum LED light that's ever been produced. I know that sounds like a big, arrogant thing to say, but it isn't. It's, it's a phenomenal thing that we busted our asses on and it's taken too long. But in a certain sense, COVID, which kind of stopped the world, made us have to go back to do more R&D and really rethink things because we couldn't get our stuff when we needed it anyway because the supply chain was completely screwed because nobody was getting their deliveries and things on time and uh, uh, not one to be sitting on my fingers and hope that everything's going to turn around. I uh, just went back into design phase and said, well, let's really polish our pencils and get this thing right. Dial it in. And we did. So um, stoked with it. The 602 is still going strong. You know, we thousands upon thousands upon thousands of them go out every quarter. Whether it's commercial facility or a guy in his garage, you can get those kind of results you want. Um, if you have growing questions, that's the biggest thing I find going forward is that how to grow with LED is a big topic because everyone used to have what I called the buddy says syndrome. Well, they have a buddy who says do this and do that, but the buddy who says that is playing secondary information from a local kingpin who's an HPS grower that his, that his dealer is or his supplier or whatever you want to call it. The methods aren't cross-platform all the same a lighting source. A guy who goes outdoors in Northern California is not going to be the same as a guy who goes outdoors in Southern Nevada. You know, it's not the same environment. You have to adjust your, your crop selection, your feed, everything else to the environment you're in. Indoors, we can make that environment. Well, if you're growing a subtropical strain, which the bulk of all sativas pretty much are, why not give them the conditions they want for the best results? You're not going to hurt the light. The lights can handle it. They're IP65 rated. You know, whether you rain on them or not, they don't care. So you can get the humidity up. The only caveat I would say with when you're running a room hotter and more humid is that 15 minutes before lights out, start exhausting that air. So the room's drying out. So when your lights go off and the plants exhale over that two hour period, you don't have a humidity spike. That's one caveat that outgrowing the LED is essential that you maintain that exchange of air as the lights are before lights going off and as they're off for a little while to keep things clean in there um going back to it spectrum king is just the cc 140 sk 402 sk 602 low pro flower there'll be new products on the horizon there's you know we're, we're about to release soon so, that will upgrade so, a couple of those classes but the so 140 we had a question, we had a yes, question sir. on your on your uh, commercial stuff. So a lot of people are doing, um, you know, commercial size grows. Uh, mm -hmm. What's the the total wattage draw on, say, a hundred by thirty or a hundred by ninety six or ninety six by thirty? One of the, you know, a standard bay. What uh, what's the total draw on something like that well, with my, 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 with, my, with with LEDs versus, say, some of the other methods out there? Well, I would have to preface this by saying yes. If you have a hundred, you know, let's say it's, it's a standard greenhouse bay, and let's say you're doing one twenty by by thirty feet but do you have static benches or rolling tables? Where is it located? Because the longitude and latitude are a big part of that discussion. Um, if I'm in a greenhouse and I'm doing just supplemental lighting and each light's doing a, an eight by eight area as a supplemental light, you know, whereas in Minnesota, that's what I'd be doing if I have greenhouses. But if I was in Southern California, I could be up to a 10 by 10 because I have enough natural daylight the bulk of the year. So it really depends on where it's located. Let's take an example of Southern California, greenhouse. Each bay, let's, you know, it's, let's say it's 30 by 120, but you're actually using 30 by about 96 or so because you need space front and back to move your big carts and things around. And you got a, a couple rolling benches. So you just have, a, you can make a four foot aisle if you need to, to get your carts through. I would supplement the entire bay. So if I'm 30 feet wide, I just go four lights wide because it, it's, I'd rather overkill than underkill because that way in December and January and February when there's not a lot of natural daylight, I'm still cranking out flower. So if I'm going, breaking it up by eight feet, by eight by eight coverage area for a slightly more aggressive for that type of greenhouse scenario, four lights wide by 13 lights long puts me at 104 feet. So four times 13 is 52. If I'm running my remote power system, I get more efficiencies. So the home user's plug-in light would use 630 watts. On the remote power system, I'm getting the same amount of light with, with 600 watts. So 
if I'm a commercial grower and I got 52 lights, it's basically 31,200 watts of lights. And then that breaks down to about only about, I know it sounds crazy, like a lot of things, but you BTUs, right? Is watts times watts consumed times 3.41 BTU per watt. So if I take, I'm just doing off the top of my head, I might be off by a little bit, but if I take 31,200 and multiply it times 3.412, that puts me in about 110,000 BTUs. It puts me in about nine tons of AC, roughly, for that entire bay. Whereas if I had HPS lights and I had 52 lights, I would need 26 tons of air conditioning. So not only did I knock off 40% of the bulb watts needed, I knocked off over 50% of the cooling needed. So my overall power savings reduction for that one bay of a greenhouse is about 50% versus bulbs. So with the AC being nine tons, if we say we go 1300 watts per ton, you know, you're looking at about 45,000 total watts for an LED lit bay versus closer to 100,000 with an HPS lit bay. That get you, Steven? Or right, he's off. No, I'm here. Sorry, I just had to let the dog out. That's all. <laughs> Now, if you yeah. catch that, but if, if, no, I was no, just giving you an example of, of, a, of an aggressive grow greenhouse that, you know, your your overall power savings versus bulb is, is damn near 50%. Yeah, and that's a, a huge thing, especially when you're doing large scale grows. Um, right. You know, you can pretty quickly overwhelm what your local transformers are and uh, yeah. depending on how willing the local power company can be on, on actually installing or replacing mm -hmm. transformers. Uh, it can be very expensive or sometimes they're willing to go 50 50 on it with you or sometimes you can find another producer that maybe you can split the cost with and they want to have more uh, and they you happen to be in the same neighborhood or maybe even another business that you can kind of well, go in on it you, you find that it's a weird thing with with power companies and you know they'll they'll, they'll ask you know for a, a stupid amount of money for an upgrade to bring up your power capacity and i was dealing with some commercial farms that are in Colombia. And, you know, they don't really need a lot of supplemental light because they're in the perfect location, depending on which valley and which hillside they're on. But we met a couple of guys that, that didn't have, you know, true, they were damn near on the equator, but they had a huge hill to the east. So they needed to supplement more light in the morning. So they needed more power than the, than the guy on the other side of the hill who was getting nothing but straight daylight, perfect all day. Um, it's your location is just as important and your exposition of your structure, if, especially if it's a greenhouse, is just as important as the power you can get available. Because if you have a, a bad location that doesn't have the proper exposition, you need a lot more power to compensate for that, that daylight being blocked. That's why you see people picking these wide open plateaus and just throwing up a thing. A big project that, that was dead in the water in Mexico is they didn't understand how supplemental lighting worked. They, they, they literally thought they could put 60 watt incandescent bulbs and that would do the job. And when we show them the proof and show them what they would need, they realized that not only could they not get the power, even if they had the money to pay for it, it was millions of dollars to bring that much power to a, you know, a couple hundred hectare farm. Um, there's projects we're working on now in South America that are mind blowing, but we, it's been proven that they can get 30 to 40% increases in crop yields by supplementing lighting on certain crops, certain time of the year on these big outdoor pivot systems, you know, those big garden wheels, those massive things that are be up, they could be up to a, you know, a half mile long sometimes. And they slowly go around in a huge circle, watering and treating. Well, some people now are mounting lighting systems to those to supplement the photons the plants absorb to expedite their growth cycle. And it's working. Um, environment, location, power available. Those questions have to be answered but coming back to the point is that you already can save, if you're in a hot area, like say Arizona, Nevada, you know, anywhere in the Southwest really, other than if you're up in the mountains, um, it's, it's close to a 50% power savings. And the other side of the coin, I knew some guys that were growing in Canada and, and up North and in Michigan that they actually complained that our lights weren't hot enough because the middle of winter, with their HPSs, they didn't have to have any heat, but with our lights, they actually had to add some heat to the room. But as I explained to them, even if you're adding some heat to the room, you're still using much less power than had you been using HPS. So, you know, if you're saving in, in those locations, just 35, 40% of your power bill, 
and you have to spend 5% on a, on, a, or on, a, on a propane cannon, which also gives you CO2, it's another benefit, um, you're still saving money, you're still saving power. So really the question you have to put down is, if you wanna get in the game, yeah, where is it located? What's this exposition and what power is available to me? And not only what power is available, but what would it cost if I need to upgrade my panel? Because, you know, one of my accounts in Nevada, I mean, they tried to charge him $2 million to reroute power to his facility. And he went out and bought his own gas turbine generators and was running half his facility fighting with the power company for three years until they finally did it. It went, the price went from 2 million down to like 350,000. So yeah, arguing with the power company, saving $1.65 million, I'm gonna argue with them too. But <laughs> depending where you're located, if they're in a strong enough situation, they have the power, you need it, they're gonna charge what they want. So finding out up front, if you're gonna a commercial facility, ask those questions. How much power do I have? What's it cost to upgrade my panel? What's the max I can get? What's the access you, to you, natural gas too? Can yes, you, know, if can you, you get, get a cheaper generator, sure, absolutely. Um, there's a couple of guys I ran into that do their own power generation and they had solar farm, wind, but the gas turbine is very interesting because uh, your, your, your cost per kilowatt hour, especially in remote locations, you, you can't beat it because the power company to bring you that fat wire with all those amps to you is not cheap. Yeah, and I've seen some interesting setups with through Cal Micro Turbine, I think was the company. Uh, mm -hmm. I also presented with them at the um, one of the California Business Association conference things last year. So, you know, a lot of hospitals, police stations, and and, and um, emergency facilities have these generators on site that people don't even know about. You know, their their own town, they're there. They just don't know about it because it's not like they advertise. These guys just get government contracts for these things, and they're afraid of cannabis because they don't want to be associated. I'm like, then make a sub brand. Oh, sorry, time out. Too funny. Now, my, my brother's walking by saying, I had to hand him his smoking materials. Yeah, no worries. Um, these generator systems and power generation systems are really efficient and they're forward thinking technologies. So it's definitely worth looking into. Um, I'll be back in the office working in LA tomorrow afternoon. So what I'll do is Stephen, I'll, I'll send you links to that stuff. If you, if we can maybe put a newsletter or something for people later, cause it's a good option to look into. Um, yeah. Coming back to the, the lighting and microbials. If people have questions or what about this, what about that? Um, I'll gladly field whatever from anyone. If there's anything popping up there, you see Steve? Um, just people saying that, uh, uh, HPS doesn't make sense in California. It's too hot, especially yeah, with yeah. how crazy it's been temperature wise. Yeah. Um, yeah. trying to look and see what other lighting questions do you guys have? Brendan knows a, an incredible amount of lighting, especially with different crops. Uh, what about, uh, advice for, for lights for people that are doing, you know, maybe just trying to, to start getting into supplementation for their vegetable farm. You know, maybe they have a, um, well, you're going to, uh, and you're vegetable. Your, yeah. your vegetable farm, you're going to break it down to crop types. And for example, if you're flowering, meaning, you know, fruiting, flowering plants, you need more intense light of a specific bandwidth. And then one of the simplest things you can do is look up the crop's DLI, daily light integral, and know where, what part of the world it's originally from. For example, if you want to grow a rare orchid, that's from the Brazilian rainforest. Well, it's got to be hot and humid as hell with a specific intensity of light towards the equator, much more intense light. But if you got, you know, an orchid from the Hindu Kush, that's one of those rare mountaintop ones that you, and you treat it like the one from this jungle, you're going to kill it. Your leafy greens are winter crops. You know, there's, there's certain plants that are winter known as winter crops. They don't need super intense light, but if you extend their, their light cycle, you can expedite their growth pattern, but you don't need super intense light. So it comes down to what crops are you trying to grow? What space do you have available? What power do you have available? You know, um, if, if I'm growing leafy greens, like three or four different types of lettuces, and I want to mix up things like that, well, they don't want it 85 degrees and 65 to 70% humidity. They want it 68 degrees and 40% max humidity. So if you want to grow these things in your garage in the winter in Minnesota, you're going to kill it. 
you're going to supply food for your family or for yourself on the cheap in a little tent in your garage. No extra heat and things will be needed because even if it gets down to 48, 50 degrees in your garage, they don't care. Those crops are just fine with that. But if you want to grow exotic orchids, well, you got to create the environment for them and the intensity they need. So let's say you bought a light that uh, one guy got a CC140 because he's, he's bringing his citrus trees inside a hangar during the winter because where he lives, they freeze and he doesn't want to kill his citrus trees. So what he does is he brings them in, prunes them, and we just give them just enough light to keep them awake for longer days so they veg longer throughout winter until the spring thaw, then he puts them back outside. And he's a few years deep on this and he's cracking up because everyone's like, your tree's beautiful, what are you doing to it? And he goes, oh, I got just a couple tricks. He doesn't want to share his recipe. But it's as simple as giving it enough light to keep it going while cleaning it and trimming it and not letting it freeze. You know, in Northern Florida, you know, a few years back, there was some bad frost and they, they had gas cannons in the fields burning 24 hours a day because that, that frost cycle came through. You, you can't, if you can't produce the environment the plants need, you're going to suffer. So whether it's a leafy green, cannabis, or some other fruiting, flowering plant, that's your first homework assignment. What's their natural environment? Where are they located? What do they need? You know, if you put cherry tomatoes with lettuce and expect to have great results for both, one's going to do well, the other one isn't, because they, they need different feed, they need different environmental variables. You know, it's not one size fits all regarding it. I hope that clears it up a little bit. All right. And uh, what about for clones and seedlings? A lot of people ask about that. Well, if you have a, a par meter or, you know, now we're getting towards measuring what plants actually use, which I'm a big fan of, the new UL8800, you know, S64 uh, thing, sorry, um, standard shows they're measuring, depending on if it's who's standard, from 350 to 800, another one's from 280 to 850 nanometers. Um, they're showing the clear benefit of small doses of infrared and UV. Again, I say small doses because HBS bulbs have way too much infrared. And that's why we always had to have so much more cooling to cool our plants off because we're basically baking them live. So the cooling is to offset that. That's why the texture and the sheen of a leaf under HPS will never look the same as the texture and sheen of a life under LED because the LED is not torturing the plant. That's why you can let the room get hotter. Because if you take a laser thermometer under an HPS room and you measure the temperature of the buds as far as the plants are concerned, you'll see that it's gonna be 83, 85, 88 degrees. I don't care if your AC says 76. You measure the temperature on those good buds, that that's what you're gonna see. Well, same thing goes for your winter crops versus your flowering plants. You could have two tents. One could be heated, one not, and have your leafy greens and the, the one that's not heated and it's 65, 68 degrees and you'll have a phenomenal result. Whereas if you're flowering plants, cannabis, cannabis takes a nap. It just hangs out and waits for the conditions to be right if, you, if that's the environmental variables that give it or worse, they wilt and die. They're a diurnal, they're, they're waiting for June 21st to come to go and now we start flowering. So if, if it never gets hot enough and if it's overcast and it's damp, they're not going to succeed. Uh, it's nerd. I suppose I'm kind of pushing it hard, but I want to drill those points home that really it's as simple as starting with where's the plant from and what does it need? What crops can I put together? If I'm a big cannabis facility and I want to grow 26 strains, I would never do that, by the way, way too much. But I know guys that who are doing that and talking about and also doing a breeding program. I'm like, wait a minute, you have 26 strains in a breeding program in the same building? Are you out of your friggin' head? I said, do you have like a garage or a backyard shack you can, that's like a mile or miles away from your facility you can do that breeding at testing? He's like, yeah, I said, please do that. Because one thing goes wrong, one person comes out of the room dirty and, you're, and your whole crop screwed. And then I had guys who were growing pure indicas, hybrids and pure sativas in the same room. And then they're, they're going, well, I don't understand. This one's doing great. I'm like, your environmental variables are what? They tell me, go, that means your sativas are doing well. I'm like, how'd you know that? I'm like, because you just told me the environmental variables you have are, are best for sativa. You know, uh, I guys in Oklahoma that are developing phases of the facility, they have their first few rooms going and they got strains they don't know. 
and they just started growing them. I heard these were good. Basically, where you started this conversation, I heard these strains are really good. So, so you've never grown them before. You don't know the supplier. You don't know what they want. What are the specifics of them? Get, send me some info. Give me a link of name or whatever one you seed you got, and I'll research it for you. I go through them, and I go, okay, these ones, this one, and that one should be in the same room. These other two should be nowhere near them because they're, they're more like OGs. They're light eaters, and you, you know, they're only going to want 10, 50, 1,100 ppm max, where these other ones are going to want 1,500 ppm of food. And, you know, like Ramo, you know, I've known for a long time, luckily enough, you know, my, my, my recipe is real simple. If I feed 1,500 ppm of nutrients, I feed 1,500 ppm of CO2. I find it's, it's a balanced thing. So, you know, if, if I don't want to waste CO2 because that's money. If it's my OGs, they're 1,100, I give them 1,100, you know? I just try to keep that kind of thing in check and balance. So the strains that eat similar can be grouped together. Now, there are hybrids, indigos and sativas, that are big eaters that you can put together. But you got to do the homework first. I mean, there's Leafly. There's so many sites you can look at. GrowWeedEasy.com. I mean, there's things out there where you can take a look at pictures and see things go, oh, that's what this is supposed to look like. Maybe I got a bad seed bunch or maybe I got a mislabeled bag, which, trust me, uh, Stephen, how many times have you gotten seeds and popped them and saw three or four completely different looking plants from the same bag of seeds? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So then you, then you say, well, which phenotype do I want to work with? Which one has the appeal? So you got to flower all of them to find out which one's going to deliver the goods at the end. So you almost have to start them, take cuts, make another generation, banking on one's going to succeed. They'll have some new moms in the, in the process at the same time. But it's a crapshoot. Then I know guys who are smart. They, they grow 10 strains. They do three laps around the track, as they call it. They go three full grow cycles. Then they realize which ones work well together and which ones they're better at with personally, attention-wise, detail-wise. Then they come back and they go, boom. Now this guy's known as the wedding cake guy because his wedding cake is better than everyone else's. And he grows it consistently. And he's got four rooms doing it. So he's getting more per pound. So he's a specialist, if you will. Um, that's the guys I find that all of a sudden they're opening another facility and another facility because they, they've got their standard operating procedures, SOPs, down. They've done the basic homework to have a system in place that makes sense that's very easy to replicate. I don't care if it's a Model T Ford to the best weed. You got to have a system and a method because improv theater is great and fun, but it's not going to get you to the finish line. And when people are buying your stuff off the shelf, it better be consistent. It better look and taste the same as it did last time, whether it's lettuce or cannabis. If I have a jar and it has this name on it and it smells this way, and then next time the same jar or the same label looks and smells different, you're done. I mean, only a rookie is going to smoke that stuff at that point because they know you're, you're not giving them what they need and not consistently. Consumers are consumers. They're going to be trendy and follow the new flavors. But at the end of the day, they know what they like and they know what they want. And if you produce it, you're successful. Oh, yeah. Any other popping up there, question-wise? Um. So lots of people talking about stupid shit that they've seen in people's grows. Lots mm -hmm. of goofy stuff. What is there anything else? What's some other goofy stuff or weird stuff? Or I was saying that I someone asked me genuinely if they could pleasure themselves to feed newborn fish because they're little and they move around, and that's good fish food, right? Um, that's something that I personally experienced. Um, uh, also, had someone use OxyClean in the fish tank, Windex to kill aphids. Uh, all of those things I well, have seen people try to do. You know, I used to have a t-shirt that got me in trouble. It said, you can't fix stupid. Um, you know, it just like certain person who's now in the hospital said, you can inject yourself with bleach. You know, there's things you just don't do. I mean, you're dealing with live animals, your fish and your system. Why would you put anything in there that puts them at great risk to lethal harm? You just, you just don't do that. Oh, yeah. I, had, I had somebody, I've had, no, not one, but two people asked me if they could use uranium borehole water uh, in, in Australia, out in the middle of fucking nowhere for their aquaponics system. And I'm like, in what universe does that seem like a good idea? Well, they, you know, maybe they, they watch the dark them. fish, maybe. So if your fish get away, you could find uh, them easy. They read the Toxic Avenger and they think somehow that's going to be a positive. Um, right. Hang it, watching know. way too many uh Well, it, promo it seems films. to me like that's the only water they have access to. You know, that's probably what it comes down to. Um, oh, no, I'm I not, understand. Just, just I'm, some I'm goofy not gonna go to stuff. That... 
I'm not going to go to weed in Fukushima, Japan either. You know what I'm saying? Like that's just that's just a bad idea. Just um, some goofy stuff that I run into. So what's some goofy stuff that you run into, or maybe just? Well, um, I walked into one guy's grow, and this is a, this is a person who's not a newbie, and you know I do my 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 close my eyes deep breath test and it passes initial muster but something's got my attention i can't pinpoint it right away so i walk around the room and i freeze in my tracks and i said pardon the new yorker me comes out and go are you fucking kidding me and he goes what and i'm looking at nanners you know he's got seven strains in the same room and i'm seeing there you know this is not day one of these things turning on these things are about to be seeds you know these little hanging down you can't have that plant in here you just fucked your whole grow you fucked your whole facility like i have to burn my clothes like i can't like, what the f you know i kind of got a bit animated about it and he's like well, that's bad i'm like how long have you been growing for you don't know that like it's again being stuck in your system and and so much other distraction going on you're not focused on your plants bad things happen you know with aquaponics with deep water culture you got to be on point you know you it's not as forgiving as soil i mean if you screw up in soil you have a chance of salvaging things but in rock wool aquaponics hydroponics aeroponics a pump fails or your water chiller dies you got 24 hours to figure it out at best if not 12. You just got to build redundancy in it. And that's where having Correct. separated separated beds and being able to, to can break stuff off and recirculate yep. stuff on low power modes and stuff, it, it becomes P and, and having good design is, is part of, you know, but, you know, and, and also, hey, you if agree. you're in an area where you know you're, you have very low likelihood of having a power outage, then, you know, maybe one generator is okay. But if you're in an area where you're in the sticks, you know, and you yep. have frequent tornadoes or some other or hurricanes or mm -hmm. high winds or some other thing or snowstorms, you better have a backup for your backup for your yeah. backup to make sure that that never goes down or you're going to be in uh, trouble. I mean, wasn't that you told me that you got, that the flooding happened in Oklahoma that we were at last year yeah. and then yeah. luckily yeah. you were up on a, you were up on a hill, but anyone that was in the plains, man, they got destroyed. Oh know? yeah. There was a, someone else that I was consulting for up here and their whole facility just washed away. Yeah. Oops. What do you do about that? I mean, um, having Nothing. driven through, you know, yeah, having you seen hope you tornadoes catch hurricane, to the system. Yeah. People used to make fun of me that I grew up with in New York saying, you go to California, they have earthquakes there. I would never go there. I said, have you ever been in a friggin' hurricane or a tornado? I'll take an earthquake any day. Um, the, I don't know. I don't, <laughs> you can keep the fire nados though. Oh, the fire nados. Yeah. Well, you know, that, that's, boy, that's a whole can of worms there. Um, let's just say that half the fires in California were started because cannabis facilities overtaxed the grid and made transformers explode. So we taken a lot of heat for that and a lot of illegal grow operations on federal land with illegal wire power taps, um, not doing us any favors, the rest of us who were playing fair, but that's what a growing pains of an industry are. Um, there's always going to be people out there who are from the money grab the short term and, and, you know, screw everybody else. Those of us who are in it intend to stay in it and work it and 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 enjoy it um you got to be smart you got to study your plants you got to know their environmental variables and what you need and the redundancies that steven mentioned i mean jesus if you don't have a backup generator or a freaking bicycle with a car alternator and a damn belt to keep something going you know whatever it takes a treadmill with a dog running you know whatever it takes to keep power going for those key things you know you can turn the lights down in an aquaponic setup but your pumps cannot go off. Your chiller cannot go off. Like you, maybe you can get away with an hour or two, but you're already hitting critical mass. You, you know, you, you, you gotta have something there. Yep. It could be, a, you know, like, like I said, as simple as a generator, it could be a pull start camping generator just to keep those pumps going and keeping a couple of lights on every other light just to keep things in their, their cycle and keep it flowing. But when, as soon as things stop and it stagnates and that temperature rises, any and all pathogenic bacteria or fungi that got in your system have been activated. And then this stink fest happens. Steven, you've had the misfortune of walking in a room a day after a pump failure and, oh, and that yeah. smell. Oh yeah, that, no, I've come in, I've come in after a bad storm. I've yeah. been one of the first people to help clean it out and everything's just toast. So yeah, I've, I've seen just about everything. But, uh, it looks like our, our time's just about up. Why don't you cool. tell everybody how to find you? Uh, I linked your websites to both of your stuff here in the description, cool. but why don't you tell everybody uh, uh, how to find you and more information about 
Spectrum King and grow and uh, more. For, for, for lighting, you know, spectrumkingled.com. My name's Brendan, B R E N D A N, at spectrumkingled.com. At Biocast Solutions, that's growwithmore.us. And I'm just Brendan, B R E N D A N, at biocat.us. Pretty straightforward. Um, any questions you have? What I call them the what abouts, because what about this? What about that? What about this other thing? Just ask. The only question that's stupid is the one you didn't ask. Now, if you ask me about, should I inject bleach into my fish to get rid of, you know, obviously my answer might not be the kindest or it might be a bit sarcastic, but real garden questions and things that your true concerns that are valid, I'll answer all day, every day. I, I'm lucky enough to be in a position to where I can do this. Because when I started off, you know, many decades ago, slinging in the suburbs of New York City, um, it's a whole different world, baby. I mean, uh, I, I survived and we're still here. And, you know, the, the gangster days are, are well behind us. But being able to share information and expand the output, like when Stephen and I get together and talk about things, we come up with new ideas because his approach is different than mine and my approach is varies to his. And then we hear someone else's input. We're like, hey, what about this? What about that? Boom, a new thing just came together. So it's all good. You guys know where to reach me. Thank you very much for your time. Awesome. Hope to hear from you Appreciate soon. It. Really